Krause is in the house. Well, technically this is a studio and she's on Zoom, but it's still a wonderful chance to speak with a very talented artist months before she makes her Magic the Gathering debut. So without further delay, not counting the statement about further delay, I give you Christina Kraus. Thank you for taking the time to uh, talk to me today. Thank you for doing this. I'm so, okay. I read a really, like, I just kind of want to go straight into it. You, you had a really awesome quote, and I'm kind of interested to hear if you could do like a dumbed down version of this. You wrote, understanding the physics between light and color is really how you can, um, you know, get a good grasp on doing art. If you were to just try to just, you know, say that to somebody who's like way dumber, what would be an example of that? Like, as far as understanding light and color? Oh, like, Jesus. Um... <laughs> You could do this. It's a really complex uh, topic. Uh, Is that okay? Because I was like, you wrote that and I was like, that sounds really interesting. But I, I wonder, do you have like a background in science as well? Or are you? Um... No, no, not at all. But like color theory is very scientific if you go into depth about it. Mm -hmm. And like as an artist, we have to find ways to um, to approach it in a more like understandable way. And then more like, like, kind of that we that we feel it when we paint so that we like I when I paint I try to not to actively think about science while I'm painting because that then the paintings turn turn uh, out too rigid when I'm trying to calculate how that shadow needs to fall from that light source so a lot of art or a lot of light and fantasy art is like really made up it just has to look good and um we just have to find a good middle ground between um, physics and that the illustration looks good. So I, okay. I guess that, something well, like that. That makes sense. No, that, that, that's <laughs> really, no, that was helpful. And I mean, it's, it's also kind of interesting that you're, I mean, you're, that was a really good description. And I wonder, I've read that you've done some incredible, like uh, you've studied under some incredible artists, um, I, I think most recently it was the mentorship with Donato Giancola. Oh yeah, I'm still in that mentorship. Oh, yeah. He, now how he's great. <laughs> it's crazy how he he has like helped and or taught and or influenced pretty much everybody that I've talked to that's like yeah. younger than him. He's just sort of like the guy. And and I mean, I'm and I said this before, but when I interviewed him, he was painting um while he was doing the interview and he didn't miss a beat. It was like He's that just, sounds like him. That sounds so like him. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, he's a total superstar. But um, what is the mentorship? What is the what is that? What does that um, uh, consist of uh, as far as taking on a mentorship with him, or in general, I guess. Um. So basically, smart school like that mentorship is happening among under smart school. Like they have a lot of mentors, and you can just sign up with the mentor you think is a good fit for you. And I thought, oh well. I really like Donato and I love his art. So I'm trying to get into his mentorship. And um, when you get in, there's a lot, lot of people who are trying to get in. So you not always make it and you have yeah. to be a bit lucky for that. Um, and when you get in, you have about like seven or other people with you in that class. And then one time, one times a week, you meet online for a class call that's about three to four hours long. And then we just talk, we talk about art, we get also uh, assignments, of course, we can donate, donate or ask every question we want to ask about business, about his techniques, about everything really. And um, for the assignments, he just gives us a pretty open-ended assignment. So basically we can do whatever we want to do. And then he just kind of, um, what's the word for that? Like sort of, uh, does he like nurture it or does he sort of give you critiques he, on it? And... Yeah, exactly. He um, accompanies us on the journey to finish that piece together with him. And uh, he gives his input, gives his critique. And every class session, we uh, we talk about that and we develop the pieces. And it's just a back and forth dialogue. And I think that's really, really, really helpful. Yeah, I, I would imagine. That. Yeah. And what do you, are you allowed to say? I mean, what did you decide to work on for your piece for that that the, the course? Have you decided that yet? I mean, do you know what your your themes? Um, are? Well, I worked. I'm, I'm working on two pieces in that mentorship right now. One is almost finished, 
And it's a Dragon Age fan art. I'm sorry, but I love Dragon I was, Age. I was going to ask about that. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> it's it's very freely interpreted. So everyone who doesn't know Dragon Age doesn't know it's a fan art. So it's okay. Um, and the other piece is a um, a fallen warrior that gets healed by a uh, by a healer. So pretty much in line with the art you see for Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. So. And um, I feel like you, you've, I mean, because I've read through on some of your posts, you talked about how you were at one point in time less comfortable doing, uh, you know, humans and and, and, mm -hmm. and you were much more comfortable with your, with doing animals. And it yeah. seems like now you're, you're much more comfortable at doing that. When do you make a shift? Like, when does that happen where you go from being nervous about doing something to feeling better? Like, is there... Is there like an assignment you get or how does that go come about? So with the animals and human stuff, it was that um, like five years ago or so, I set the goal to be a Magic the Gathering artist. And I did art for, I did humans and elves and all, all that kind of stuff. But then one day I got an inquiry by Hitpoint Press, the guy, the people who do Humblewood. Mm -hmm. And um, they only have animals and anthropomorphic whatever it was yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anthropomorphic. That's, that's exactly. it, yeah. um, characters in their world so i had to learn how to paint animals and uh those kind of characters and because of that i got out of practice with uh, the humans and the elf stuff and also my goal to be a matching artist kind of uh got put on the back yeah, the back like, burner yeah so because I had to focus on like also earning money and, and getting my name out and all of that stuff. And uh, so that's why I focus on animals. But because of that, I got really worse with humans. And then last year when Magic reached out to me and I had that email in my, uh, oh, wow. my, in my email uh, folder, I was terrified because I was like, Jesus Christ, it's too <laughs> early for me. I need to get better at painting humans because that's what I want to do for magic. And uh, yeah, that's also why I'm doing that mentorship right now because the nader is really good in painting humans and uh, he can help me get better with that. Yeah, he his hands, I mean, the, yeah. the, the hands he yeah. paints, they're just like, they're like realer looking than the hands that I have like in front of me. I'm like, it's it's crazy. crazy. Um crazy. but okay, so that's the that, that makes sense. So like, but you got you they reached out to you, which that had to be yeah. mind blowing. I mean, did you think it, when it, you got the email was. you were like when you I was absolutely email, not prepared? The funny <laughs> thing is, the funny thing is, uh like two months before they reached out, I started to work on a portfolio for them, like on a magic card portfolio that was specifically targeted to them. Right. And uh, I had finished one illustration. I posted that illustration. And then like a week later, I had that email in my email. And uh, I was terrified, like, oh, my God, no, it's too early. And um, has it working with on um, the, the game? Has that been has it been everything that you thought it would be? What are you know, like, is it is it surreal? I mean, because now technically and you can Donato is going to be considered a contemporary of yours when you are eventually released and that's got to be surreal yeah it is for sure um i mean it's it's a lot of fun and the briefs are a lot of fun and i worked on many fun planes and sets for example i worked on the lord of the ring set which will be re released next year and that's i love tolkien i have a uh, tolkien tattoo here so um and you you cosplayed back in the day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I did a lot of elf. <laughs> and you made the did you make the outfits as well? Yeah. I How myself. the hell <laughs> do you get good at like both that and art? Because also, I mean, to backtrack a little bit, you did not really actively pursue art as a professional right until like your late uh your late 20s, right? You've only been mm. uh, like actively pursuing it, which yeah. is it's just astonishing how quickly you you're you know hit hitting that ball of the park. But you can do both of those things. I mean, are you formally like are you formally trained, or is this about just you picked it up? 
Well, with, with sewing, I would say that sewing is a skill compared to drawing. It's very easy to learn the basics. Like you can learn to sew within six weeks, but you cannot learn to draw within six weeks. So, um, yeah. And the sewing stuff was also very, uh, it was always only a hobby. And uh, the, the costumes looked good from the outside, but when you turned them, they looked really bad and almost as if they were falling apart. So well. I didn't really sue that well so my art definitely i always had a more focus on art for sure and how how like what was like the first time that you was it lord of the rings that got you like hooked into sort of like doing the fantasy world because i know you like you are a huge fan of tolkien but what was it that gave you that like that first rush of like i love art this is what i want to do yeah i think it was I think actually it was seeing Donato's Lord of the Rings paintings like 15 years or so yeah. ago, like forever ago. And I mean, it took for me, it took forever to me to understand that you can actually make your passion into a living and uh, and uh, earn your living with that. That took long for me to understand. But um, I think Donato's artworks were definitely a part of why I got into fantasy and uh, yeah. So that makes this this uh, mentorship, that's even like, I mean, you must mm -hmm. be just giddy with, uh, you know, like excitement. I mean, yeah. hard work. That's so cool that you, 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 that was a pinpoint that made you get into art. Then you set a goal to get into magic and then you are then uh, able to get into a mentorship with, with, you know, the person who was responsible for, yeah. inspiring you to do that i mean that is like some fairy tale kind of <laughs> like shit it's, it's like that's awesome um so it so when was the first time that you got paid and and i mean like and you counted it as far as like a reasonable <clears throat> amount of money but what was your first paying gig as an artist what was the first time you got money and you thought okay this is gonna work well, the first time I got paid from a publisher was um, in 2017, I think, end of 2017, by a German pen and paper publisher, Ulysses Spieler is the name. Yeah. The uh, dark eye, the dark eye and the dark head. I don't, I think they have a, an English translation by now, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I'm not sure because I tried to find it um, and I wasn't. It, it was trickier to find, but I'm also very ignorant to it. I, I was sort of like just enjoying going through it and seeing this entire world. And, and then also uh, wondering, and I'll ask you about it later, but the, and I was like, not safe for work stuff. I mean, you don't see that kind of stuff in fantasy. That's edgy. Um, mm -hmm. And um, there's sort of like, that's almost sort of a big no, no in fantasy. Like it's, it's weird. Am I wrong in thinking that, that like, that like they will, they'll like sexualize people, but the actual inclusion of sexuality or sex is sort of taboo, right? Uh, you mean in the dark eye? I mean, in, in well, and in general, cause it's like, well, for instance, I, I'm gonna mispronounce it, but you did, you had a scene where it was, um, it, it's like, it looks like I'm assuming maybe a young elf girl that's sitting alone in the pool and she's at sort of- Oh yeah, okay, that was, um it was like a special book within the dark eye it was a uh for, for adults mm -hmm. so basically a a porn version of that rpg for everyone who was interested in exploring the sexuality of the characters i guess that's what this was about and it was the only time i painted actually something that was so suggestive because usually the art i paint is very you know kids friendly and uh, not really yeah. sexual but you do have yeah. a crush on i guess his name is solas a solas um solas yeah <laughs> so okay what's the story behind that because there oh jesus <laughs> I know because I've, i i I'm, I'm looking at him like hmm like because you know i'm a complete ignorant you know person I'm like this might be maybe he is maybe he's like um someone that she dated and then <laughs> I'm like to... we're married to. <laughs> um, but so what what is the story behind this uh this very real crush you have on uh scary? Yeah, how do I explain this? Um well, so 
I always like the Dragon Age games, and so this is a part of that. And uh, he appears in the third game out of the franchise. And uh, basically, he's a ancient Pantheon figure, but you as a player don't know that when he is in the game at first. And uh, so he travels around with you and tries to fix a lot of things that are happening. And later you find out that he is also responsible for these things that are happening and uh, he kind of falls in love with you if you let him and if you pursue him. So as a player, you have the option. You also have the option to punch him or to like hate him or to just have a friendship with him. It's just your choice as a player, what, what your relationship is with that character. And um, I guess I always found it interesting how, how he's in your castle all the time and actually kind of the villain and antagonist where you are looking for someone completely else that you think is the villain, um, but he actually is the antagonist. I don't really like to call him a villain because he he don't he doesn't have like malicious intentions or anything, but he's a very complex character and that's really? why I, I I appreciate him and like him a lot. And uh, and you know he's always got that very like he's always got his head shaved very like smoothly. It's, I don't, I mean, it's, he's, he's gone his game, you know, got those eyebrows done, uh, threaded <laughs> maybe, but like, so, okay. So I get it. So he's like, and I think I remembered you read or writing something about this where people were sort of kind of giving you crap about, um, you know, like somebody being, you know, you, you mentioned that you liked people who have, you know, varying degrees of like mm -hmm. that they're complex. And I agree. Yeah. I think that there's something fascinating about somebody who like say is, uh, what people would consider unethical in one aspect of their mm -hmm. life, and then they go home and they're like a good parent or something. Mm -hmm. It makes it's, it challenges people. You know, not everything yeah. can be Disney. You know, good mm -hmm. versus evil, which there's a place for it. But so exactly. So he's and, a very morally gray character, and I think a lot of people don't really like that because they can't label him as good as bad because he is something in between and his choices always depend on the circumstances and yeah yeah people seem to only like they only want to handle either or like it's like exactly life is they, not they can't handle either. both yeah <laughs> yeah there's 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 a lot of gray i mean i don't know yeah. a lot about color theory but i do know that there's probably a whole ton of different grays from you know white neutral to, grays they yes. are the magic of every artist yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and um so What's kind of uh, what's kind of interesting about your uh, the way you do your artworks is that you have these very colorful, very um, ornate and very like cl then classic uh, um, paintings that you do, and, and and then your sketch stuff is just like it's fire. Um, do you see yourself like maybe doing a graphic novel of some time? I mean, because you have that that the, the style that you do, I just see it like mm -hmm. like being really good for that. Is that something that would be like feasible for you or was that very time consuming it's very time consuming i mean i love sketching i love drawing i also love drawing and line art but the thing is that uh, the comic industry of the of the industry is really badly paid and everyone's overworked and uh what i hear from my comic friends isn't that well nice i guess and so i always was I always thought that I'm I can't make that work for myself, at least not like in terms of making a living like for myself. And uh, when I when I'm drawing and painting in my free time, I still draw and paint, uh, draw like this. But um, yeah, as as making a living with like just drawing and comic style, I, I don't think I can make that work for me. That's, I guess that's valid. Um, now, this might be this might be like a little bit like, uh, I guess, controversial, but what I'm really interested by is your stance on NFTs, because it's very hard for me to get artists to say why they feel a certain way, and you seem to have a very strong stance on it, and I was wondering, could you, like, give me your take on it, because I'm open to it, they just confuse me, yeah. I thought they were good when they first came out, they mm -hmm. seemed like it was a good idea, and then it is, I'm learning more and more about it, it does not seem like that is the case, and yeah, I, why is it that you do not care for them? Oh, well, so at first I was the same and I just wanted to see how that stuff is going to develop and maybe, you know, maybe it's 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 worthwhile. It's worthwhile pursuing. But then 
Uh, a lot of inquiries happened from people who are into crypto and metaverse and NFTs, and they wanted to work together. And uh, at first, I, I read all of that stuff they sent me and, and, the, and the contracts and all of that stuff. And But I quickly found out that a lot of it is just like fake. They try to screw, screw you. They try to make you work for uh, under minimum wage or something like that. Uh, which 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 is in contrast to what they always tell that oh my god you you're going to make so much money with nfts and artists it's it's a new platform or it's a new thing for artists they're going to go rich and that's just not the case most of that stuff is like really just trying to get you into doing a lot of work for very little money and so and and because it's not regulated by any sort of like, I guess, some like yeah, tax exactly, or government or exactly. whatnot, they can do whatever they want, right? There's no exactly. labor rights or yeah, laws. Exactly. And you were approached by by people, they they, they, they attempted to, to get you to do this. Constantly, it's still constantly. Like I get, I don't know, 10 inquiries a week that are NFTs, NFT related. And at this point, I don't even read them anymore. I just delete them because yeah. it's... It's crap I, most of the time. <laughs> I mean, and we don't have to include this in the interview, but you know what would be interesting if somebody, I don't know who, would accidentally leak a contract from one of these things out. I don't know who could do it, but if somebody did, because um, I'd be fascinated to read that because I think as non-artists, it's they it's very, we're very kind of kept ignorant for a reason. Mm. And this this is an answer that I've never like even just, I mean, that makes so much sense. They're basically trying to get people for like slave wages. It's, you know, like it's yeah. the scam. And then they, I'd imagine the contracts also stipulate that they get the lion's share of whatever, um, you know, money they make off of it. And so yeah. is it possible for somebody to even like legitimately make a living as an artist for a sustained period with those things at all? Or does it I mean, I guess... There were some artists who did, did make a lot of money last year. I think when when the hype was like really uh, blown out, I mm -hmm. think some of my colleagues also sold some NFTs for quite a bit of money. But you know they did it like one time, and then the, the market kind of like crashed and they lost interest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but also the the thing about NFTs, one of the main things I just don't like doing it is because I think it feeds into a system, into a capitalist system we already have so many problems with. And uh, that just contributes that to that, the entire crypto meter wars stuff. And it's just, I don't know. I don't I want mean, to have any part in that. It, that's valid. But, you know, it's, it seems it's even more dangerous than capitalism because at least, it, I mean, capitalism at least is supposed to have a government that is yeah. keeping things in check. So, yeah, it's capitalism, but worse. So. Yeah, it's like it's like um, capitalism on capitalism, like drunk and on steroids. steroids. It's just yeah. sort of like, and that's that's astonishing. I mean, really, that I mean, and I mean, what like you would be if they if they like say for example, like what is the like a price that these people like any company like who made you an offer like what is the actual like amount that they're asking to that you accept like for the work that you do like how much um, like it really depends like from the inquiries i got a lot of them asked me to work for free what? a lot of them yeah so that's nuts. that's really common that you then then you have to to upload your work to some dubious sites where they can generate clicks with your work and that's part of the scam and uh they try to get all of the rights so basically a total buyout for like zero and um, they just screw you over in any way an artist can be screwed over, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, well, what sucks about a lot of higher education in general, they don't teach you, they'll teach you how to do like what it is that you're trying to do, right? The mechanics of drawing or for my instance, like English uh, masters, but then they don't teach you about a, the business side of it. Like, what mm -hmm. is it? What does it mean? Like, what's a good contract? What is not a good yeah. contract? What, what is a scam? What is a good deal? And they especially can take advantage of young artists because it, they're just, they're starry eyed. And, and I think it's the same yeah. with like any sort of artistic yeah. field. 
is that you're just sort of like you're desperate to do it and you don't know any better. Um, What would be like in your experience, what would be some advice that you would give to people starting out that would be like things that you learn where you're like, pay attention to this, like first thing, you know, as far as that kind of goes. Mm -hmm. One second, I get something. Okay, no problem. So basically, I would recommend everyone who starts out as an artist to get this book. It's the handbook, pricing and ethical guidelines for graphic artists, basically. And this book has everything any artist needs to know about the business side contracts, pricing practices, how you negotiate and all of that stuff. So this book saved my life so many times. And uh, I think without it, I would have been screwed over several times, probably. That's, that is, that is a great answer right there. I mean, you had a visual like to go with it too. Like, um, well, that's fantastic. I mean, I've never even, you're the first person to show me that, but I'd imagine it, it is maybe like a, like a good, a best kept secret. I mean, does it, I mean, I'm sure the, I think, I think every every one of my colleagues in in the English speaking room definitely has this book. I mm. think so. Mm. And also Donato and then Dan from the mentorships, they also recommend recommend to get this book. So and um definitely speaking of mentorships, Howard Lyon, you 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 also got to work with uh work with him or work under him. I'm not sure if that's what the correct term is, but you were doing studies of with him um oh no 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 that's uh basically just he, he does these amazing reference packs and uh as an artist we can purchase those packs download them and then do our studies with his material and when we and usually when we upload those studies online we tag him and then he you know he, he comments or he shares but we are not at least i am not officially training under him or something mm-hmm, so that's mm-hmm. okay I gotcha. I mean, he's, he's another one of those, like, like his stuff really looks like the Renaissance, like paintings Mm -hmm. where you're just like, this is museum quality kind of like stuff. Um, Where do you get like, I mean, and I, and I, I know that this is a common uh, thing for, for artists that I've, that I've talked to many, many times. You mentioned that your, your family and your friends don't, really get your art um as far as like making a living off of that Mm -hmm. how do you how do you manage to to push through that kind of stuff because i know it's tough when you're not getting the support um what were some of the things that you turned to to get lifted out of say you know the bunk of having people that you love and you know care about not really giving validation to your your life's work and pursuits I mean, the thing is, when my pa- when my parents understood that uh, I can actually make a living with that and support myself, they changed their opinion and they got more supportive of it. But yeah. before I earned money and wasn't able to support myself, they were kind of against it because they thought, as in the typical artist cliche, that uh, everyone's poor and that I'm going to enter poor under a bridge or whatsoever. And uh, so it was very hard to uh, to to convince them. But I, but I also I will, I'm always very stubborn, and I just do what I think is right. And I just kept doing that. And I guess at some point they uh, got around and thought, well, she's doing what she wants anyway. So and we can. I mean, and what's really astonishing too, and I know that you don't like to put too much. Um, like, you know, too much thought or too much credit into this, but the, it always blows my mind when I see people with the amount of followers you have on Twitter. When, oh, what, oh, I mean, Twitter. Twitter is loaded, it's a loaded, <laughs> it's a loaded gun. Cause I mean, in, in truth, I hate Twitter. I think Twitter is mm-hmm. awful. I have to be on it, but I hate it. Um, it's, the, it's sort of like that, the notion of like the town square where people get publicly shamed like back in the old yeah. days, it just used to involve a small group of people, but now it involves the uh, the world and people just mm-hmm. sort of go there to throw tomatoes at whoever's in the stocks, whether they're, uh, 
guilty of something or not guilty of something. Um, but I am curious, like, when do you go from, I mean, what happens, what happens to, 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 you know, take you from this small amount of followers to like astronomical? I mean, like, is, is it something that happened quickly or was that just sort of a gradual thing? Um, well, I think one big part of this is that my work just started to get good, good enough to uh, attract attention from other people. So when, when I started out as an artist, my work was bad, obviously, and uh, that doesn't attract a lot of people who want, to, who want to look at your art. And the better your art gets, and the more active you are online, the more people it attracts. So it's just like a natural... Uh, natural thing that just happens when you regularly post art that is on a good level and also when the art uh, talks to people so that that they uh, kind of identify with it and um, feel something when they see it so that's what what attracts people I think and uh, yeah over time that just goes up and up and up and one of your pieces went viral that I read um from a humble what I believe? Oh, that was the, the secretary bird, probably. Yeah, that was crazy. That still is viral, I think. <laughs> so how does that, do you wake up in the morning and you're all of a sudden your phone is just like, you know, notification, notification. I mean, what, what was the, what was that like? I've, I've never, I've never gone viral except for when I had the flu. So it's, I'm kind of curious. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I don't know like with me it's like I, I look at my phone and I'm like what the fuck is happening what's what's this and, and then you you try to to find out what the reason for all of that is and uh I th I I am I'm honestly I'm uncomfortable with going viral because it puts a lot of attention at your person and I'm a person I'm very introverted I'm very quiet I'm a bit of a reclusive and um having so much online attention that's it's a lot and then and when it's and I'm always happy when it kind of like goes down again and things start to get quiet and I can focus on my work gotcha I mean yeah because you do <laughs> have to deal with a lot of shit right like I yeah the, the people that you know you and then it happens to anybody with any you know notable success you see these people just get on and just like just vomit up the most negative crap that's not like that's nowhere even near on point and it's like i don't think people remember that they're human beings the yeah. same way that they don't realize that they couldn't do this if they didn't have a screen name to hide behind um, yeah. and i think sorry no 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 go on I was just about to say that I, I think you just have to learn to ignore that these kind of negativity and also have to keep in mind that when people say mean things to you, they usually don't really mean you. They are just mm -hmm. frustrated at whatever else is happening and they just and you are just like uh, the 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 channel for them mm -hmm. they can put their frustration to, but it's not really something against you. They are just frustrated. Or they're um, super jealous, which yeah, I mean, all that, all that. <laughs> I love it, I, and I loved that you wrote, and and it was, and I'm curious to know, like there was somebody who years ago, you know, said, "Oh, you'll never be in Magic Gathering. Your work's not good." Or uh, and while you you mentioned in the in the uh, message, you said, "Well, I, technically it wasn't." Like at the same time, like, well, who would be like? That's just like. Why would you say that? And I'm wanting to know, do you know if like you, I would love to know if they know that you're in it and if uh, they're just eating crow right now because. They, they know, I told them actually, because that was one of the things that, that kind of made me going in spite of these, these kind of comments, uh, because I wanted to show this person in particular that I can do it and they not they don't get to uh, dictate my life like that and uh, so yeah when I got in with magic I wrote that person a message and that person was actually a, 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 uh, a former schoolmate of mine like she was in my class when I uh, when I was younger in school and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah so but, that was a good feeling yeah right <laughs> I bet, did she write back? Did she even say anything? I bet she didn't, but she was like. Mm. Uh, I don't think so. I think, no, she didn't say anything back, but 
whatever. That's, um, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I take joy in it just because it's like win. I mean, you know, you can't take that away from you. And I mean, but it is really, again, super astonishing that you waited till, you know, I mean, and there is this whole stigma and I interviewed um, Iris Compete about this too, where there is this sort of stigma that, you know, if you're past like say 30, it's too mm-hmm. late, you're not going to be a successful artist. That's I, so untrue. <laughs> I mean, and you're living proof of it. You didn't um, start until quote unquote too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I started, I think I was 27 when I started to take it more serious. And my first paying job was when I was 29, I guess. And now I'm 34. And it took me five years to, to get in with magic. So if you set your if you set your mind to it and work to consistently work towards that goal, you can do that at any age. So there's no and what's nice about the magic artist community is there's the, the support that you guys uh, have for one another. And I I wonder like if you were to give advice to say people who are starting out, like in, in regards to networking um, and getting to know other artists, because you said yourself that there are other people that were bigger than you that gave you an in and, and you were sort of going against like a lot of online people, you know, talking talk smack about the bigger names. What would be like some advice that you would give to people that would be like, what's good, like authentic, networking that you could do where you're not going to come off as like maybe like uh like scammy or or uh... yeah i mean i guess just just be honest be yourself don't try to be a different person online um be genuine when when if for example when you when you want to write a comment to an, to an artist you really admire or aspire to then uh find something in that comment that they maybe don't hear every day and uh, like like more than just oh this looks amazing because they hear that all the time but but a more like involved comment comment um and they will remember that and if you keep commenting they will remember your name and uh, maybe at some point you have the opportunity to start an actual conversation with them and uh yeah so just be genuine and honest and just be part of that of that circle of people online, if you can. And I saw in a photo of, I think it's you, another, I, I, I'm blanking on the other artist's name, and then Paul Scott Canavan. And oh, I, Paul, yeah. I, I, I interviewed him. <laughs> a lot of fun. I, I couldn't tell, I, I, were you guys, at, it looks like you're at a fashion show, but you're not, right? You're at a, you're at No, a, that, that was industry workshops. That was an artist event, I think. That was where the photo was taken, yeah. But it looks so funny. The guys really do look like you're you're looking at the catwalk, you know, like you're. Yeah, saying, we be like, well, we like this. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, very like that's good. Yes, that's this year's look. Um, so who are some of the the artists that you got a chance to get a lift from? Uh, that that helped you along the way. Like who yeah, are some? Paul of- for sure. Paul mm-hmm. played a big role in that. Um, Lisha Hennigan was a big part of that. Like she got me onto Humblewood. Okay. Um, and then Colin Boyer, who is a former art director at Magic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Jason Rainbow, of course, who's my partner. So uh, he definitely helped a lot with that. Um, I think those were the most influential in terms of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did you have any other artists that were in the game that you like, like along Donato that you were just super, like you're super fangirling over, uh, like who are some of the people that you like get starry eyed when you, you know, Carla Orchards. I really like Carla. <laughs> she's, she's great. Yeah, she's on my, she, I would, I, I will eventually get her to do an interview. I mean, I, I will try, but she's, yeah, she's fantastic. I mean, like, yeah, I, I met her once, like, like in Berlin a few years ago, I got to chat with her and she's really approachable, really kind artist. She's amazing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and always motivates you and to do, to pursue your dreams and keep doing, keep pushing. Yeah. If money was not an object, you could buy any painting in the history of painting. What would be a few of your choices? If you could pick one or two, like what would be 
just a dream painting. And we, I'm saying like, you could buy Guernica if you wanted to. The, it's, mm-hmm. it's just a total fantasy of what you could get, but I'm interested to know what you would. Probably a lot of the works of John Singer Sargent. Like I love oh. his work. I have a lot of books about his, his stuff and uh, JC Leindecker, of course. So uh, it would be amazing to own an original of those artists, but. I mean, I yeah. have 17 of them in my like bathroom. I had, t- I mean, I trust me, it's amazing. I, I, I own them all. I purchased all of them. But it was like- One sec. Um, let's see. So this painting in particular, this is my favorite painting of Sargent. I would love to own the original of this, but yeah. I wonder how much it even, it's probably like, it's probably, you know, I, you know, it's always one. I mean, you wonder, is it even like it must be on display, right? Because it's I'm I'm actually not sure. Like I saw some of this painting and paintings in London in the museum there, but I don't think this was among it. It's a bummer, right? That sometimes people, these people will purchase these paintings by these masters. And I honestly mm-hmm. feel like it's sort of your 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 duty. If you buy it, that's fine, but you gotta at least let it go out and do its rounds. So the world can see what the best of the best is, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's sort of like, uh, like I heard the other, I read that somebody like, it was like, there were a bunch of Picassos that had never been seen before and somebody bought them. And it's like, what are they actually doing at, you know, like they're holding what a dinner party for like five people and they come in and they say, that's my Picasso. And people go, oh, <laughs> cool. I have one cool. too. And it's like, yeah. it's almost, like, it's like not even, they don't enjoy it it's almost like an emblem of success right i think it's for a lot of people it's just like an investment for for their money to uh, buy these kind of paintings mm-hmm. i mean yeah. i don't know a lot about the uh traditional fine art scene so i think you're right i think you're right now one thing that i also am curious about now i know that you prefer to do traditional painting for your personal work um but then mm-hmm. you, you said you'd like to do digital for clients now that's a whole nother kettle of fish when it comes to magic. Um, oh yeah. Did you opt? I don't, well, I mean, did you opt to go traditional or did you go digital? Uh, I mean, my plan for the future is to do my magic cards uh, in oil. So, uh, but that's a lot of work to be really good at oil painting. And I've never painted in oils. I have not even painted in acrylics or like the only traditional medium I've painted in, painted in is uh, about watercolors or gouache. And those are not really mediums where you can work to get on a polish that's polished enough for magic. So all of your work is digital? My work is digital. Yeah. What? Like all of you. are good. What you see online is digital. <laughs> that's, okay. See, and that's what I love. I love it, especially when people are like in digital. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, You've probably been fooled by it because I assumed that there was some of it was at least because no. it's, I can't that see that now that's, that's a win <laughs> for digital. And I think that people are coming around and not being as judgmental as they first were with it, you know, claiming that yeah. like, if you know how to open, you know, paint all of a sudden you're going to be good. I'm like, well, I've done, I've tried it. And like, I mean, it, it's, it's like nowadays the uh, you have so many options in the programs that you can emulate traditional art pretty well with the different brushes. Photoshop offers, for example, there are a lot of texture brushes. And with, when you work with those brushes, your work has, if, if you know what to look for, your work gets in traditional feel. But you can also go the complete other direction and, and get a very digital look if you just, for example, use soft air brushes or... Um, or for example, League of Legends splash arts to me look very digital because they're so polished. You, you don't get that polished with uh, traditional art. Have you thought about even because I know that there is uh, even a market for sketches of the like versions of whatever magic pieces that you've done? Mm-hmm. Is that something you could see yourself doing? Because um, I, I, mean, I, I think so in the future, definitely. Um, so when I've done that mentorship with Donado, I'm going to take half a year of break from mentorships. And then next year I taking again a mentorship, but 
for oil paint. So that's when I want to start oil painting and also slowly get in that sketching process. But it will be um, a lot of time until I actually can send in traditional work to wizards because they also want to make sure that you are actually able to get get to the same level. Done, yeah. yeah, like how you do it with your digital work. So they need to approve first before I can do a traditional work for them. Oh, I see. So there is the, okay, I got you. So there's sort of like, a, you can't just like switch over to another no no um, i need to tell my art directors and ask them if it's okay that i send in traditional work and if they think i am i'm couple capable of doing it they they say yes but if if they've never seen traditional art of me and they don't know how i paint traditionally they are likely to say no please send in digital sketches or work right so then you'll just sort of uh, you'll you'll arm yourself and private yourself you'll get, you'll get good at it and, and which by exactly. the way i'm sure you'll be i'm sure you'll define because i there's I've like read tons of other like very talented people who've had the same kind of nerves that and the same inexperience that you're talking about. And you kind of take to, to like duck the water because I don't think that you it's sort of like can you play, you know, piano or can you play keyboards and synthesizers? It's like you'll pick it up. There's just like a little bit of a learning curve, but you've got also you've got all those years of of you know doing the actual work, right? Like putting the mm -hmm. hours in that is needed to to become a professional, like that whole 10,000 hours rule that they say, I think it's, you do that much and then you can consider yourself a professional and an expert in whatever field it is. Um, I feel like you'll like kill it. I mean, I, I'm really just honestly shocked that not even like that all of them are, are digital because- I mean, I'm flattered, I'm flattered. Well, but it, traditional art definitely has a very steep learning curve, and especially if you're used to digital work, um, it will. I know it will be hard. The transition will be hard because in Photoshop, the easy thing about Photoshop is that I just can't pick the colors however I need them. But with oil painting, I need to mix them and I need to match them, and uh, that's a whole different level yeah. of skill that you need to learn before you can go to the actual traditional painting. So. Yeah, I'm sure you'll you'll nail it. I mean, but like for instance, like um, like Edda, the character Edda, um, that you that you do, like I was oh. blown out. Did I mispronounce the name? Is it? Uh, no, no, it's it's Etta. Etta. Okay. So I mean, I'm blown out by. It. I just assumed that this was a painting. Um, where did she come from? Like, what was the? What oh was Jesus, this? that's so long ago. <laughs> You, you you really do talk a lot about her and she's sort of like uh, at least she was if, if not sort of like a, an alternate version of you that is um like maybe not an idealized version but some somebody who is sort of like living an exemplary life uh but what what was the the story behind that because i think it's pretty cool i mean basically i invented her for one of my inktober projects in 2006 17, I think, or 18, something around that. And uh, because I wanted, I wanted to tell a story with the drawings I'm going to do. So not just like a random Inktober drawing, but like a story. And for story, you need a character. And uh, that's how I yeah, invented her, thought about her, gave life to her. But honestly, I haven't thought about her in three or four years, because basically, when October finished, the story I, I told with her was also finished. So that that character was also done for me and, and finished. So it's did she die? No, I mean no, no. She, I mean she's she's uh, she's. I, I I think I did one bigger piece, one bigger digital painting with her with the flowers. Um, yeah, that's the the one that I thought. Like it looks like orchids, maybe that she's holding. Or yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, so basically. Never... I'm sorry. sorry? Go I go on. Um, so basically at the end of his story, she kind of um uh what's the word for that? Resurrects. Resurrect. I think yeah, but not exactly something like that. So, so she, basically she, she died though, it sounds like she did. Um she she she, she doesn't really die. Like she just learns a lot of life lessons and stuff and grows as a character, and then she emerges. Oh, after those life like lessons as a new person yes something like that 
Oh. And uh, so basically at the end, she's like a stronger, better version of herself, which she wasn't before. So that's basically and how she ended as a character. I mean, I'm just throwing this out there, but, you know, like, who knows? Maybe she ends up on a future magic card that you don't know about. I mean, like, it could easily could be. be it could easily be done. I mean, it's that's the if the, the brief calls for, a, you know, a, a female um anything it's i mean probably wouldn't want to make her a vampire right because that would just i mean it could but it would be a little sad i guess because she's vegetarian isn't she like she is a vegan a like vegan I'm, yeah yeah <laughs> no, okay so but i mean i am i'm i am uh i don't eat mammal can't do it mm -hmm. um the vegan that's that's tough that's tough i mean it's isn't it terrible it's terribly expensive right i mean it, especially with not really i think there's a lot of misconception about how expensive vegan food is or i mean maybe it depends on the country but at least here in germany it's it's relatively cheap to eat eat healthy on a vegan diet and uh, it's just what i prefer doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i never yeah. liked meat and it was always the the, the uh the obvious choice for me to not eat animals and i never yeah. questioned that do you i mean you don't like miss eggs i love eggs i just do it can't i mean i the only thing i had trouble with was maybe cheese that's something mm. i i missed for like a week or so but it's really you're just used to eating it and when you eat something else instead you stop missing it at some point so it's just like you know a transition what about i mean but like ch chocolate or or like yes I mean, amazing vegan chocolate and, it uh, it's yeah. that good Okay. It's, I like it better than the uh, non-vegan one because the non-vegan chocolate is like very sweet and overly sugary. And uh, I don't like that. So the Those vegan sweet. versions are usually a bit less sweet. And What? Yeah. Is there a sweet vegan chocolate? Because, I mean, I can't help it. I'm a trashy American. I like the sugary stuff. Um, I can't, you know, it's like, um, but is there like a type of, is there like a brand that's like, is there like, vegan Hershey like sort of I mean is there like I mean there's like a German brand they are they're called Lind and they make excellent chocolate also vegan chocolate non-vegan chocolate they make all kinds of chocolate I mean and, Germany uh, makes good chocolate like yeah. in sleep right it's just sort of yeah like... honestly the 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 chocolate in Amer uh, in uh, the USA oh, it's, crap. States, it's, it's atrocious like I was there I, I tried it it's way too sweet like what what is this oh god <laughs> what did chocolate. you try what was what was the brand do was it like oh i don't i don't remember i don't actually remember maybe milka oh. i don't know oh, that's a german brand i i don't know the yeah, no, it is i, I, I understand know. that it's like i i mean i've had german chocolate before and i'm like oh this is this is good like this is way better than what we have it's sort of like the equivalent of like having like um like a very like fancy salad with like the freshest ingredients versus like maybe some like lettuce on a napkin sort of just with no dressing it's just it's yeah i mean it's not good america can't really do the the candies that well but you know what what can you do? i mean there, there are also amazing things in america i think that i tried but i don't remember the names and um what like I do, I, I'm wondering like you, I, cause I did, you know, I do a little like a uh, sort of like um, social media stalking and I saw that you went to the, to Niagara Falls and what was, what was like the, the, um, the urge to go there? Because I'd imagine, I imagine you are, especially people that, um, you know, from Europe, they're, they're sort of, you guys have that like awesome ability to like take a train to another country mm -hmm. where in America we, you can drive for four days. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you're still there. It's, and yeah. there's, I mean, you know, four days of driving, you think that you would be somewhere where somebody speaks at least has the politeness to speak a different language, but they don't. But what was it that drove you to the Niagara Falls? Because it just, I'm uh, curious. Well, we, we were staying in Toronto in Canada, which is where we go, like just an hour drive to Toronto mm -hmm. Falls. So we just were, okay, let's, let's go and check them out. If it's just like one hour away, why not? Mm -hmm. Like they were famous out of uh, out of the states and Canada, so yeah, yeah. we just did that. And but I was shocked at how much entertainment was built around those falls because, like the uh, the promotion images, 
kind of give that impression that they are in the middle of nowhere yeah. and like a very nature feeling and then you you drive closer and it's just like entertainment stuff and like noise and loud so that's oh my like god shocking. that is shocking that wow that's not you're right that's i literally imagined it to be like you go into like a preserve and it's just yeah that's what i thought too yeah and but that's not what it is. <laughs> you're telling me that there's like Disney Niagara, there's like a Niagara yes, like yeah. hot dog stand and a Niagara yeah. t-shirt shop. Oh God, why do people have to do that? You know? I don't know. Like, just can't anything just be, I mean, that's oh, unfortunate. It was still nice. We took the boat to and we drove right up to the falls, like where the all the wind and all the water gets in your face. That was amazing. So. Yeah, and it seems like I almost would be a little nervous because it's so powerful. I mean, even just yeah. seeing it from a distance, you you're like, this thing is just it's giant. I mean, you get very wet. I would bet. And you know, like <laughs> and you got, I mean, and you, and you got hats off to the people with the selfies that like fall, you know, like <laughs> I know it's just Darwin happening. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but um, I won't keep you for too much longer, but uh, one thing that I wanted to, I saw that was interesting that I want to ask is that you kind of did like a like and dislikes thing. It was like sort of like things that you liked. And, and one thing that I found interesting was that you said that you dislike sci-fi, which I would have thought you would. Oh, that was forever ago. Yeah. <laughs> I would have thought that you would be like that you would somehow dig sci-fi because it's sort of like cousins to fantasy. It's just sort of like cousins, like a futuristic cousin. But what what is it that, about sci-fi that you that you find to be less than satisfying? Um, I mean, when when I say sci-fi, I probably mean something like Star Trek more in that direction, and uh, also from the point of a painter because i don't want to paint spaceships and all of this hard surface stuff that exists in sci-fi because that's just i'm not good at it and i don't want to get good at it so uh, <laughs> it's just not really my uh my favorite thing i just like fantasy a lot more because there's a lot more organic stuff and and, and yeah I mean, I'm very fascinated by space. I like, I, I'm interested by space stokers or universum stuff, uh, black holes, planets. I love that stuff. But Have you heard the recording that they did of the black hole? Like you can actually- That, that weird noise, yeah. I, oh I, my I God. Saw that. I, 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 my <laughs> friend sent it to me and I was like, yeah, I'm going to listen to that for about one second. That's good. I don't <laughs> need to know what that sounds like. I, I mean, you- Well, creepy. Yeah, really disturbing. <laughs> I mean, it was sort yeah. of like- it, it it really like, like, rrr, yeah like hell noise. opening up yeah um, like what the hell is this <laughs> it's terrifying i'm like that is a, a it's kind of interesting right that like as humans we're like that is not a good sound <laughs> mm -hmm. but um yeah do you think that you like what would be an example of a fantasy character you have never done you've never done that you are maybe curious to dip your like toes in the pool of it but you haven't like quite done it is there like say like um like a vampire mm -hmm. or a like a like a ogre anything like those that you are kind of curious to do i think i would really like to paint like an elf vampire something like that that would that would be something i'm interested in painting i think yeah the like one of the original magic artist anson maddox his story in his head that when he did the first lanaware elves for magic the gathering was that it was actually a Lanaware elf that had been bitten by a Sangir vampire. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they could make an entire set out of that. Mm -hmm. I would love it. Like the Sangir vampires versus like, which uh, whatever, you know, the Lanaware elves, like, I mean, why don't we see vampire elves? We need more vampire elves. There's not, I mean, can you even think of one that's like, even like, I mean, I don't think there is one that's sort of well-known, right? Well, Dracula. But, <laughs> but he wasn't an elf. He was just a yeah. Dude. That's he true. Just a, he was no. A, I don't. I don't think so. They're the vampires are usually just vampires. There are right. no elves. And it's like which makes sense. But uh, I mean, in fantasy, everything is possible. So yeah. I mean, like we'll definitely need more elven vampires. <laughs> I would say. I mean, like that's kind of. I'm like you should. I mean, I'm just saying that's that's a cool idea. I mean, if I was good at art, I'd be like I'd be running with it. But because it really does seem like there's so many untapped, it's one of those really good untapped ideas because there is sort of like this whole like 
like idea of like an elf being something that's noble or, you know, mm -hmm. there's a positive, uh, you know, they're, they're usually the heroes, yeah. right? You know, but then corrupted elves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm just saying, you know, if like you roll with it, I'm just, that's, it's to me, I think that's a, a great idea. So spread the word and, you know, like, but, um, before, have uh, the, a personal peace planned with that actually but i don't think i will finish it before the end of the year so really you are you have one in the works i i have started to think about it so the idea is there but i still have to get to actually do the work on it and oh it, wow yeah. well i can't wait to see that i mean i know that you're like not it's it's in the uh the like early stages of like you know it's still an embryo but man like that kind of stuff is just like I will love that because it's just it hasn't been done really, and, and you know, like it's other than mm -hmm. Anson telling me that that was his intention, but that wasn't what it was. That's not where the um, the sort of idea went. And I was like, that is just yeah. like what I mean. They did Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer, and you know, they have like <laughs> you know what I mean. Like Abraham Lincoln, yeah. you know, gets gets involved with it first before elves. I just, mm -hmm. I mean. Um, so, uh, before I let you go, uh, one last question would be, is there anything that you're working on now that you're allowed to talk about that you would like to, uh, plug here? Uh, well, currently I have the two smart school pieces in work, which I talked earlier a little bit about, and I have a magic card I'm working on where I don't. I don't think I can talk about it because, no, you know, probably. NDA and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me. It was amazing. It was actually my first interview in English, I think, ever. So, yeah. It you nailed cool. it. You nailed it. <laughs> I'm, I, A plus. I'm excited to see what the future brings with Christina. And boy, did it help me figure out NFTs. In fact, if a token can't even be bothered to make itself fungible, don't mess with it. I mean, that's just plain lazy. And plus, does anyone know what Ethereum really is? I had a friend tell me they actually bought what they thought was a whole blockchain of amino acids and then it came with a modem that glowed in the dark and that's where they said the Ethereum lived. But only later did I find out that I really bought was a painted tissue box with a snap glow stick inside. That's what my friend said when they told me the story. Shit. Bye-bye!